Hello, I'm Charles Bowman and welcome to this another special episode of Off the Agenda. Today we are in the historic city of Oxford, home of the oldest university in the English-speaking world, and I am delighted to be joined by Baroness Valerie Amos of Brondesbury, who has had an extraordinarily impressive career spanning politics, education and much more. She started that career as a researcher with and for local Labour Party councils in London, where she served as a women's issues and race relations officer before navigating her way to the Equal Opportunities Commission, becoming the chief executive of the commission in 1989. She co-founded Amos Fraser Bernard, an international consultancy business who advised Nelson Mandela's new South African government and was later given life peerage conferred by Prime Minister Tony Blair in 1997, becoming the first black woman ever to sit in the House of Lords. She served as the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs and Secretary of State for International Development, becoming the first person of colour to serve as a Cabinet Minister. And in 2003 became the first black woman in person to become the leader of the House of Lords and Lord President of the Council. She served as the British High Commissioner to Australia in 2009 and in 2010 was appointed United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. In September 2015, Baroness Amos was appointed Director of SOS, University of London, becoming the first black woman to head a university in the UK. And five years later, she became Master of University College, Oxford, where we are today, as both the first female appointed to that post and the first black head of any Oxford college. And in January 2022, Baroness Amos was appointed Lady Companion of the Order of the Garter by Her Late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. She is the first black Lady Companion or Knight of the Order since its foundation in 1348. And it is my great, great pleasure to welcome Baroness Amos to Off the Agenda. Baroness Amos, Valerie, can I start by saying thank you so much for joining us on Off the Agenda today in the wonderful college in Oxford. Uh, it's a real delight to meet you. And may I take you back right to the beginning? You were born in Guyana, South America in 1954 and moved with your family to Great Britain in 1963. What were those early years like for you? And can you share some of your childhood memories? Well, actually my father came first. Um, he came a couple of years before us and we followed in 1963. The backdrop in Guyana at that time was, it was pre-independence. Um, there was, uh, you know, an independence movement, but there was also quite a lot of tension in Guyana between the Afro-Guyanese population and the Indo-Guyanese uh, population. And I have a vague memory of 1963 when we left, um, when there were, uh, race riots uh, mm -hmm. in Guyana between the different communities in Georgetown. But we actually lived way in the country. I'm a country girl at heart. We lived at a t in a tiny uh, village on an island in the mouth of the Essequibo River. There are three huge rivers in Guyana. I think people very often, because we're a nation that very much align with the Caribbean, they think of us as an island rather than a country being on the continent of South, South America. America. Um, and, um, you know, very uh, much, you know, sort of big rivers and uh, Venezuela, Brazil are the countries that are closest to us. And when you arrived in, in the UK, you had attended Bexley Technical High School for, for Girls, where you became the school's first black deputy head girl. Can you tell us about that experience, how you were encouraged, and perhaps what you took away from that first student leadership role? I think the first thing to say is that I was the first black girl in that school. Gosh. Uh, and my sister was the second three years after me. Uh, so we were very much a minority, but I was very studious. My sister was very sporty. I love sport as well, but I was very uh, very studious, very quiet actually, which people sometimes find uh, surprising. Um, and it was a school that really suited me because it was a school that had 
you know, that strong academic piece, but uh, also prepared young women uh, more on the technical um, side. Uh, and I think that, you know, being an environment amongst other young women who had also passed the 11 plus, um, it really helped me, um, I think, because it was a really difficult thing to move countries, um, to be a family in Kent, who one of the first families in uh, our community. So there was a lot of interest um, in us. Um, interest which was people had never seen, many people had never seen a black person uh, before. Uh, our parents really helped us to deal with that. Uh, but also a lot of assumptions about who we were, what we were about, where we had come from, the kind of knowledge about other parts of the world, despite uh, Guyana, British Guyana as it then was, nice. being uh, a colony of Britain, the kind of understanding um, was not very great about what these countries were like. Um, so part of what we had to deal with, had to struggle with, was you know, there are many who thought that actually we came from the African continent, not the South American uh, continent, for example, um, had all of those uh, preconceived ideas about what it was like, how we grew up. And in educational terms, actually, we were way ahead others of our age group in our schools. So there are a lot of things for us to grapple with as individuals. We got a lot of support from our parents in dealing with that, but a lot of things that those around us also had to adapt to. And your parents, because your parents were both teachers. So they were both Education uh, was absolutely a key Education foundation. Education was sent front and center of who we were and what we were about. Our parents were absolutely clear that a good education opened up so many opportunities. Fantastic. So a really important foundation, a very uh, important foundation. And following school, uh, you took up place at, at Warwick University yes, where I you did. studied uh, sociology. And then beyond that, you started your career in public service working in equal opportunities. And that was in local government in the boroughs of Lambeth, Cam uh, Camden and Hackney. Keen to understand what inspired you to pursue a career in this field and what were some of your early learnings? Well, I think it's important to go back a bit because I think that whole experience of being a migrant, coming to a different country, watching my parents adapt, although I wasn't conscious of it at the time, it was very much part and parcel of the way that I grew up. Uh, seeing the discrimination that we faced, uh, learning how to deal with that. Um, uh, Michelle Obama had this amazing phrase, if you'll recall, when uh, you had some of the Trump comments about uh, uh, America and so on. She, she said, when they go low, we go high. Um, and it was very much the approach of my parents, which was you know, to help us to deal with uh, racism, with discrimination, but in a way which wasn't about sinking to the level of those who were perpetrating that uh, discrimination. And this was very, very much a conscious part of my growing up. But in addition to that was just also that sense of being part of a much bigger world, that there were all kinds of independence movements happening. Um, there were, uh, certain kinds of uh, independence uh, movements, which involved violence in some country, countries on the African continent. So we were always had a very outward uh, facing uh, look at the world. So that's how I grew up, very conscious of, you know, Britain being part of something bigger, as a black person being part of something much bigger, much greater. So in going to university and in going to uh, Warwick. I met people from all over the world. I became, you know, very close uh, to friends from different countries on the African continent and uh, elsewhere. And I had a huge interest in issues around equality and uh, social justice. And I think that my commitment to public service and understanding how 
public institutions shape who we are and what we're about came from there. And so that partly drove what I studied, but it also helped to drive where I saw my career as uh, ending up. At one stage, I thought um, about being an academic, but it, it wasn't something that really suited me. It felt too lonely in a way. And so linking back to my interests, to those interests around social justice and equality, I worked as a race relations advisor, as a women's advisor. Um, these helped to guide the kind of work that I subsequently did. Tremendous. And that commitment, that passion, that interest, that foundation uh, resulted in you becoming the chief executive of the Equal Opportunities Commission in 1989. And that, that's an organisation now part of a new single equality uh, body, the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And you performed that role for five years. How did you navigate your way into that role and what pivotal moments shaped you? It was interesting. I, I saw myself as having a career in local government, having started in the London Borough of uh, Lambeth, then I worked in uh, the London Borough of Camden, and then in the London Borough of Hackney. And I could see uh, that uh, I felt very comfortable in local government, and I could see that this was a place where I could be successful. Um, and I was headhunted for the role at the Equal Opportunities uh, Commission. And I have to say, I resisted the headhunter a bit. Um, you know, she called me up. Uh, said that she'd heard my name many times, was, uh, encouraged me to apply. I was a little resistant. She kind of guided me through the process and I ended up uh, being offered uh, the role. And it was such a pivotal moment for me in my career. And I think that there is some learning there for all of us that, you know, sometimes there you can be guided to something which you're not necessarily thinking about which actually will have a profound impact on you. I moved from working in local government to working on the national stage. Um, we were funded by government, um, but independent of government. Yeah. Uh, it was a time when we were using uh, judicial review to challenge government legislation, uh, which uh, had an unequal uh, impact. Uh, for example, an unequal impact between part-time workers and full-time workers, the majority of part-time workers uh, being uh, women, and we were successful. Uh, but it also gave visibility to me as well as to the work uh, that we were doing. So it was a very, very important time. I learnt a huge amount. I learnt about you know, working with uh, ministers, working in a highly political environment. I learned about uh, advocacy. I learned a lot about leadership and management. This was an organisation that had offices uh, not just um, in England, uh, but also um, in Wales and uh, in Scotland. So, you know, managing at a distance, as it were, was also uh, important. A, a tremendous role for me in terms of my growth and development. Yeah, a pivotal role, as you, uh, as you say. And then following that in 1995, you founded a consultancy firm, Amos Fraser Bernard, uh, through which you became an advisor to the South African government on public service reform, human rights and on employment equality. And that was just after Nelson Mandela was elected president in 1994. Can you tell us a little bit more about this role, the critical issues that his government faced and perhaps the support and influence that you were able to provide? It was an extraordinary time. So I went with friends to South Africa after that historic election victory and it was incredible to see the huge challenge that the government faced. I mean, you know, apartheid had meant that there was a small section of the population, the white population who were doing extremely well, had all of the services uh, focused on them, and the majority of uh, the black population lived in, you know, terrible housing. Uh, they had a different kind of education system, different kind of health care, but also you had some extremely successful uh, black people who also had to live in the townships. I mean, 
you know, the system was absolutely appalling and the challenge for that government to try to bring about um, equality, to try to level uh, the playing field when you had such a huge gap and distance uh, between those who were doing extremely well, purely on the basis of the colour of their skin, and those who were not. And that government um, and the ministers in that government, their uh, civil servants were looking everywhere for advice and um, support. And it was as part of that, that we formed our consultancy and spent so much time working in South Africa. And of course, it was a huge eye opener, a big learning curve for me, working in a different culture, really trying to do reconciliation, um, whilst at the same time, you know, acknowledging you know, the hurt um, and more of, of that past. You know, uh, it was a past that was actually filled with uh, hate uh, from uh, some parts of the community. So trying to restructure services so that uh, they did work to the advantage of the whole community. I also worked with the, the Commonwealth, with the Commonwealth Secretariat, on um, elections and election uh, monitoring and particularly trying to help at a local level to help people to understand the importance of local elections and what those would mean for them, you know, with people who understood their issues and would stand up for them. Working on employment equity issues with uh, the Ministry of Labour, working on uh, justice issues with the Ministry of uh, Justice and also working on human rights issues with the Human Rights Commission. It was an extraordinary time for me and I learnt so much. Uh, extraordinary, as you say. And, and thinking or playing it back, you had started local at, with local government, you'd moved to national and then you'd moved into the international realm in very swift order. Yes, and it, it seemed like a natural thing to do because those issues around social justice and equality and inclusion, they work at many different levels in our societies. So all of these uh, seemed natural to me, but it was also about seizing opportunities. I was someone, uh, and I hope still am someone, who is not afraid to seize opportunities as they arise. Thereafter, in 1997, you were elevated to the peerage where you took up the title of Baroness Amos of Brondesbury for the London Borough of Brent. And during your time in the House of Lords, you carried out many vital roles, including, amongst many others, International Development uh, Secretary. What was the political environment like for you at that particular moment? And perhaps sort of looking back and forward, how has British foreign policy changed uh, over the last 20 years? Well, of course, there was huge excitement in 1997 when Tony Blair won the um, yeah. election. And um, it was on the back of that that I was asked to uh, go into uh, the House of Lords. Um, I was then asked to come into government um, a year later. Patricia Scotland and I were the first two black women uh, in uh, the House of Lords. So there was that tremendous sense of excitement and with the huge majority that we had as um, a Labour government, a sense that we could really make a significant impact on Britain and we could be different. And Robin Cook, of course, um, was very clear that he wanted, he was Foreign Secretary, that he wanted a foreign policy that, you know, had values at its heart. And being part of you know, a multilateral system, an international system where uh, Britain could really play its role in a positive way. But of course, there was also that recognition that as Britain, we had a colonial history. We had the history in relation to the um, uh, Atlantic uh, slave trade and the impact that that had had on the world, but also on Britain. And one of the things that I think I and others were very keen to try to do was to ensure that, you know, domestically uh, in our education system and everywhere else that we were really thinking about that past and the impact that it had had on all of us in terms of our present and the impact that it would have on our future. And I think we are still struggling with that um, as a nation. I think the way that 
we now have those kind of culture wars and that kind of uh, sense from some that, you know, don't mess with our history, as if history is not made up of a whole number of different parts that you bring together. And actually what we are doing by talking about, you know, the different elements of that history is opening up and expanding and really beginning to understand who we are, what we are about as a nation, and why it is we have such a diverse uh, population. That's something that we are still, I think, uh, struggling with. But in terms of our foreign policy, of course, the kind of key thing that had a big negative impact on our perception as uh, a government, uh, but also I think had an impact on us as a country, was the war in Iraq. Um, and I think we are still seeing uh, some of the fallout of that. But I've also seen, um, I was International Development Secretary, I did a lot of work in development. We had at one point, I think, a kind of national, uh, a kind of coalition that was in support of that broader international development agenda. Uh, it was really important for the work. I think that has shifted over time. I think we have become much more uh, internally focused, uh, much more focused on a kind of narrow nationalism in some instances that has taken away from the way that we are viewed uh, internationally, but I think also the way that we see ourselves and our responsibilities. And I very much hope that bringing back that kind of values piece to how we see ourselves as a nation and how we operate on the international stage, that that will be part of our future foreign policy agenda. Working with others, you make reference to the word coalition too. In that. Definitely um, working with others. We cannot deal with these huge global this challenges is... that we are facing, uh, trying to be one island. So thinking about who we work with, how we deal with that. The recent pandemic was a, a good example of that. You know, how can we work with others to make sure that those countries and peoples in the world that didn't, for example, have ac access to the vaccines in the way that we did, that we could play a different kind of role. And that was one of the things that was so important about the development of the vaccine here in Oxford, because that was a key part of what they were about, which was that this vaccine would be offered at cost to countries around the world. Indeed, that's a very, very good example, an example of it. You became the British High Commissioner to Australia in 2009, continuing that international perspective. And then in 2010, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon announced your appointment as Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Perhaps tell us a little bit more about that Again, extraordinary role at an extraordinary time. It's probably the hardest job I've ever done, um, but also probably the most fulfilling job I've ever done. And I've done a number of really interesting jobs. I mean, I have loved doing all of them. But in that role, I was responsible for coordinating the response to humanitarian crises across the world. I mean, obviously working with other UN agencies, uh, working with civil society organisations domestically and uh, internationally. But the key thing about this is that you're responding to different kinds of crises. They may come out of conflict, they may come out of famine, they may come out of uh, flood, um, other kinds of natural disasters. And these are happening around the world all the time. I was constantly uh, on the road um, because part of my role was to draw attention to what was happening across the world and to try to find the resources to make sure that we were able to respond, that we were supporting governments in their national response. But also when you think about conflict, it's also about how do you try to work to prevent those, but also how do you try to work to bring them to an end? And so many of the conflicts that I worked on during my time are still ongoing. Syria, uh, which evolved uh, during my time. You know, I inherited 
um, you know, conflict, for example, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is still ongoing now. So managing and leading that response effort, you know, working in a highly politi political and politicized uh, environment within the UN, trying to find solutions to these different difficult and complex uh, challenges. This was my day-to-day uh, -day life. It's a job that I described as you go in with a full tank and basically the tank is running down um, over the years because it really is a job that's 24-7. Um, yeah, extraordinary role um, and an extraordinary time to do that extraordinary role. But you also very fulfilling in the sense that you see the worst of humanity but you also see the best of humanity. The way that people will support each other, each other in yeah. the midst of uh, the most horrific circumstances is something which is really extremely humbling. And when people said to me very often, as they did, why has the world forgotten us? It wasn't always possible to come up with an answer, but I knew that part of my job was to make sure that the world did not forget. Listened and responded. Valerie, you are a woman of very many firsts. You were the first black woman ever to sit in the House of Lords, to serve in a British cabinet, uh, and most notably as leader of the House of, of Lords. How did you feel taking up these positions and which roles perhaps brought with them the most challenges? And how did you navigate your way through those challenges? Well, I always say to people, somebody has got to be first. And I think the important thing is that you don't close the door behind you. Um, there are lots of advantages of being first because in a way, nobody has trod that path before you. So you can do it in your own way. But of course it brings with it quite a lot of scrutiny. It also brings with it, I think, quite a lot of uh, personal, uh, uh, issues that because you are the first you think to yourself you have got to do this well and one of the things that I know is that for us to get better at what we do we need to make mistakes but it's very hard to make mistakes in the glare of being the first because you feel that you are letting the side down um, so it's important to know yourself um, to make sure that you have support that you keep your feet very, very firmly on the ground. Um, people around me have always been very proud of what I have achieved and very supportive. My family first, but also a wider community. And that has all, always, always helped me. Tremendous. And another first relates to your influence in education we talked about earlier. You became the ninth director of SOAS University of London and the first woman of African-Caribbean descent to be a director of a UK institution involved in higher education. And following that, uh, you became Master of University College Oxford, where we are today in this wonderful uh, surroundings. And again, the first head of any Oxford, a black head of any Oxford uh, uh, college. Education is clearly very important to you. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that passion for education and about the influence that you've had in these various roles. Well, education has been a very strong thread through my family. My uh, grandfather on my mother's side was a head teacher in uh, Guyana. My parents, as we talked about already, were both teachers. My sister was a teacher in the early stage of her, her career. And I have one of my nephews who's now a teacher. Um, so huge pressure on the next generation. Uh, one of them will have to be um, a teacher. And education for me is important because it's not just about, you know, opening up for us, you know, a big vista of what is out there uh, in the world. It's also about the opportunities that come to us as a result of that uh, education. So it's a big kind of uh, intellectual project, uh, if you like, um, helping us to see the world in uh, very, very different ways and giving us the opportunity to make decisions for ourselves about where we would like to place ourselves in that world. But it's also about the opportunities that come as a result of that 
which could be around uh, employment, but they're around other things as well. So for me, reading has always been a very important part of uh, my life, having the opportunity to discuss and debate with others, as I did very much at uh, university, being in an environment here now where, you know, this is about the young people who are our future and having an opportunity to engage with them about the things that interest them, but also to see the more complex world in which they are having to navigate and perhaps having an opportunity to give a little bit of guidance um, and uh, advice along the way. Tremendous. And we'll perhaps come back to that in a minute as my, my final and concluding question. But you've received through the course of your life many honours um, and cemented yourself in British history by becoming a lady companion of the 674-year-old uh, Most Noble Order of the Garter, an honour reserved for royalty, former prime ministers and highly esteemed individuals and you are the first black lady companion or knight since its foundation back in 1348. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Order of the Garter, what it means and perhaps explain to our listeners and viewers what the Order does day by day? Well it is one of the highest um, honours in uh, Britain so for me uh, this is a recognition which is not just for me. I think it's a recognition that, you know, comes uh, for a community that I am part of, um, but also a recognition of the importance and the important role that we play as black people in British society. Um, there is an, uh, uh, an annual uh, ceremony. Um, the order is based uh, in Windsor. St George's Chapel is our spiritual home. Uh, there is an annual procession uh, from Windsor Castle down to uh, St George's and uh, there is then a service that is held. When there are new companions, as there were last year in 2022, um, it was myself, the then Duchess of uh, Cornwall and uh, Tony Blair, then there is a ceremony in the morning uh, actually, it starts at midday uh, to induct you into uh, the order. Um, we were privileged to have um, the late Queen, uh, who uh, is the person who made the decision about us becoming uh, members of uh, the order. Um, it's a very personal thing for the monarch. There are only ever 24 members of the order. Um, a few members have died, so we are a little light. So I would expect that there would be uh, new announcements over the next um, few years, but it's a very, very privileged position uh, to be in. In terms of day-to-day uh, -day duties, we don't really have day-to-day uh, -day duties. It is very much an honor in the way that an MBE or an uh, OBE or a knighthood is an honor. But it is nonetheless an extraordinary uh, uh, honor um, and one conferred upon the individual decisions taken by the monarch of the day, the Queen in, in your case, That's back correct. in 2022. That's correct. Can I, you are an extraordinary role model, Valerie. Um, and my final and related question, it brings us back to the, your reference to the next uh, genera re generation. And this is a question I ask to all my guests on uh, off the agenda. We live, as you say, in complex and very challenging times. They are difficult for this new gener the younger generation, perhaps where hope and aspiration uh, are much needed. What lines of support and encouragement and advice would you give and do you give to the younger generation as they start out in their own career? Well, I'm, I'm always a little careful about giving advice um, because they are growing up in a different kind of world. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to have discussions and to, to, to think through and give a kind of guiding hand um, when asked. Uh, what are the kinds of things I would say? Um, I think working hard is really important. Um, you know, none of this uh, success as uh, it is seen from outside comes without quite a lot of hard work, quite a lot of challenge. I think it's important to really have a sense of self, to know who you are, what you care about, um, 
and what you'd really like to do with your life. And that doesn't have to be a huge thing. I mean, I'm always so impressed looking around at the people who are doing tremendous amounts of work in their local communities, for example, making um, a difference. So everybody doesn't have to do the kinds of things that I did. I think the important thing is to have a bit of a sense of what you as an individual would like to achieve and who can support you to get there. I think the support and building alliances is incredibly uh, important. Uh, we need people who will give us feedback, honest feedback. Mm -hmm. We need people who will keep our feet on the ground. But we also need people who will be really supportive as well when we're going through difficult times. That kind of critical friend. You know, the love of your family, wider community, friends um, is important. But also just having people who say, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought that? Give you permission to maybe have a wider vision or sometimes to narrow it down a little bit because it is, uh, it is so big. And the last thing I would say is that in life, having life and being able to live through our lives, it's an extraordinary uh, thing that we're doing, even when it's in really, really difficult moments. So yes, be serious, but also have fun too. I love that. I really do. You mentioned the concept of the critical friend, that support, and it brings me back uh, to the message you made when you became the chief executive of the, um, of the uh, commission back in 1989. You made reference to the fact that there was a, a, a sort of guiding mentor who led you through the, the recruitment consultant who led you through the pathway to it. Uh, that is the sort of meth message that you would be giving to others to support the young generation coming through. Yes, and, and, and to listen sometimes to what the advice that others are giving us. You don't always have to take it, but sometimes they know something or may, they may have seen something in us that we haven't seen in ourselves. Fantastic. What a lovely way to finish. Working hard, coping with challenge, a sense of self, um, a view as to what you want to do, but to have fun with it all. Valerie Bar Baroness Amos, thank you so, so much for sharing your wonderful, inspirational story and stories to all of our listeners here on Off The Agenda. And we wish you all the very best ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's been a real honour and privilege to speak to Baroness Valerie Amos today and to hear her inspiring story and stories. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you all for listening. That's all for me other than to say, as always, stay tuned for more conversations, great discussions and inspirational guests. Thank you again and bye for now.